keep a check on the numbers, which is always a bit restless. Would you like to sign on one of the sheets there, which uh, sort of thing is there? Thank you very much. Any, one, one there. Anyone else not signed? There were, of course, other machines in the range after that. 
after the, besides the Model 30, sometime later we had a Model 25, and already mentioned we had a Model 20. And up at the top edge, <coughs> Uh, apart from the Model 75, there was a Model 91, a Model 95, and then a Model 85. But that was very much later. That gets us into about uh, 19, if my year right, uh, 69. So that was really the end of the 360 series, and then it went on the 370s. Right? So, we had an announcement, as I say, a Big Bang announcement in April 64, and then the 40 was the first machine to be really in a state to be tested, and we bore the brunt of the announcement testing for the series. And uh, then we shipped in April 65, and as you can see, the other machines followed in the sequence show. The Model 75, in fact, was shipped in January 66. I remember at one point that it came up this morning. I probably left the impression that very little was done to test the software before announcement. Very little was done in Hersley to test the software before announcement. We, we built a number of prototypes that we shipped around from Nodalit to Educop and Poughkeepsie, which supported all the software testing. I thought it was very gratifying to go into Poughkeepsie. We just built a new, new building. There was a big machinery on the, on the ground floor with 25 model 40s. Never seen so much. <laughs> right. The next chart maybe shows in a rather more gory design, and we go in this neat progression 1, 2, 4, 8. And the 75, which isn't on the chart, is still 8 by spite. Uh, In fact, the core technology took a long part uh, to run it. Um, again, going down to machine register width, you can see you've got 1248 and uh, cycle plans which at least do monotonically decrease. Machines use 30 nanosecond uh, as per delay per stage. So it's, and then the last one you see the
so on. And we held them in a local store. Uh, it's a record store, and you could either read from it in one machine cycle or write to it in one machine cycle. Uh, this is where the Model 30 diverged. Because the Model 30 couldn't even afford that. <laughs> the Model 30 had to hold these objects in memory. And they didn't have, obviously, a 16-bit data flow. So they were more strapped on moving data around the machine. Um, as well as that, you can see the read-only store, uh, read-only store address register. Basically, the read-only store sequenced uh, and had a, uh, generated the next address from fields within the read-only store. And in the general sequencing of instructions, you could get a four-way branch on each ROS instruction. There was, in fact, so that was the real result. And at this point, let me now talk about the channels. We had two kinds of channels, multiplex channels and selected channels. And my Flinders is going to talk about these, so I won't do too much. But let me just find out where the um, selected channel data flow comes into the CPU. From the read-only store point of view, uh, we had two address registers, one for the CPU and one for the channel, or Brosca. And when the selector channels, which ran independently with their own buffers, needed to stuff that in the memory, they just switched the machine, interrupt the machine, dumped the EAT registers, switched to Rosca, and took over this data flow to go to memory. So they put in their channel address memory on a separate bus, and the data went into the R bus, and then into memory. <coughs> I think that only leaves one oddity about the machine, and that is this thing called a bump in memory. And it's not an unfortunate bump. Uh, the Multiplex channel, particularly, could talk to many IO devices. And the status for each. So that's the uh, model 40. Um, and if we go up a stage to the model 50, you get a similar pattern of registers, only, of course, the registers in this case are four bytes wide, instead of two bytes wide. <coughs> uh, and uh, they have a, a full width adder, which is a four byte adder and shifter. So they have a four byte wide data flow, which is shown in blue going back to all the registers. And they have for doing the VFL instructions, a, a mover, which does moving and does the um, logical connectives like exclusive or and or and so on, which is wrapped around in this for all these VFL instructions so that it became quite painful for the top end machines to uh, get good performance on variable field length. Yes? So could you just say what the VFL instruction is? Oh, I beg your pardon. The um, <coughs> decimal and character instructions uh, were generally done in storage, and they had a variable field that is specified in the original one, for example, up to 255 bytes, uh, 256 bytes, uh, which were going to be operated on. And as I would say, this got extended. How much? Was it uh, 64K? 12 bits, it must make me 4,000 uh, bytes. So all of these, from a performance point of view, you see, represent a great challenge, because depending on how the fields were overlapped, you could get very curious effects. <laughs> they may not be very useful effects, but they were all laid down in the architectures of what had to be done. And the architects were in supreme control 
what I would bit by that is that whereas when you get some, uh, let's call it little problem in implementation with one machine, you rewrite manually. <laughs> no way. <laughs> with, with five machines, <coughs> the architects could divide and conquer. <laughs> there was no alternative but to make the architecture of the machines conform to the architecture as written, or else go and change the whole architecture for all the machines, which was different. Well, that's what happened with many times. Hmm? But, but the attempts were made many times. Many more indeed, yes. <laughs> People didn't give up, but <laughs> they generally lost. <laughs> so, um, so you have a full byte line data, a full byte ladder in this machine. <coughs> and uh, you have memory um, and a local soul, which is in the core here. Now, it's in this machine that you start, in my view, diverting a bit from pure read-only store machine. Because they start adding uh, extra things. You can see them explicitly here that we have an instruction address and a storage address register. You've got more money in these machines. They get more data. But they also have a counter for incrementing the address. And that's good, of course, in some ways. Whereas in the top machines, they sometimes had to add hardware in order to emulate efficiently. <coughs> so the 3040 uh, were, if you like, uh, well behaved uh, uh, read on soul machines. The uh, 50 and 65. Uh, were had at least a fair amount of uh, um, hardware control under the microphone. So that's the 50. Um, to think about the 65, all you need to do is think of the register as going to 8 bytes wide instead of 4, and the adder. I think the adder, in fact, is 56. Um, that's 7 bytes. So they could do a complete floating point operation in one cycle. The um, other thing about this is that when you went to the 65, the local store was held in transistor registers. That is, no longer in core store. So you got a great speed advantage in the um, register. And lastly, the bump disappeared. Because on the model 65, they used totally independent channels. So, didn't need a bump anymore. And uh, I think that is really about all I have to say. Um, I think if I were to summarize, um, you can see the um, the method of getting 51, 51 formats. Oh, there's one more thing on the model 65. To get more memory back, the memory was interleaved. So you uh, got twice the bandwidth that normally you would get from a 0.75 microsecond memory. Um, Whether you should uh, go and meet your neighbour 
usually upwards, never downwards. People never have ambitions about easing up the version underneath the traffic too difficult. It's always upwards. Folks in there was a man called Pete Fagg in charge, who started off by appearing a very, to me, mild individual because he was kind of soft spoken. But he had a totally iron grip on all these um, sometimes uh, roughly behaved project managers. <laughs> <laughs> Very often told us, no, your job isn't going to go faster. Your job is to make what you promised in terms of product cost. <laughs> so stay where you are. <laughs> and uh, that's first of all. The other one is, it's a comment that's been said before, but um, I think I should pay tribute to, to Morris Wilkes, one of our designers. <laughs> The, the, the sequence goes rather like this. If we weren't microcoded, we couldn't emulate other machines like 14 or 1. If we couldn't emulate, there would have been no 360 today. So I think we have to rate Morris Wilkes as one of the great designers of the 360, because without him, we wouldn't have made it. We would have fallen by the wayside somewhere about uh, 1963, I think, because inside IBM we've been cut to pieces. So, thank you very much. Same type of plug and socket and uh, logical connection, i.e., 
a standard interface. So the components in the I.O. system were the, the channel, which was the box of logic which um, talked to the devices, the standard interface, which was the bunch of wires which connected the device, the I.O. devices to the channel. Um, and there were two types of I.O. devices, two broad classes of I.O. devices, those which were single devices like a printer, where the printer mechanism was driven by a control unit, that control unit to talk to the standard interface. Um, and then there were the, the multiple device um, I.O., like tape units, where you may have a bank of tape units all connecting to a single control unit which connects to the interface. Communication is another, another example of a, a multiple uh, device. The sequence of, of an I.O. operation was that the central processing unit would be chundering through its instruction stream. When it came to a start I.O. instruction, it would kick the channel. The channel, it would pass to the channel the name, the number across the standard interface and talk to that device and issue the command to it. Uh, the CPU would be then released. Sometimes, of course, the device might be busy or there might have been some kind of error uh, which stopped the, uh, the operation. Usually, the, the I.O. operation <coughs> in progress. A few words about the standard interface. It was a very conservatively designed uh, interface, I think, with, with hindsight. The channel had a series of lines which went out, which all of the devices listened to, address out, command out, service out, and a bus which went out from the channel. And that bus had parity on it. One of the examples of conservatism that was a parity bit carried along with the eight data bits on the, on the bus. And the control lines, address, command, and service, stated what type of data the channel was putting out on the bus. The control units on the interface had lines into the channel, again, address, status, and service, and a bus into the channel, and place an address on the bus. The devices would look at that address and there was one other pair of lines, select out and select in panel. Channel would put the address on the bus. All of the devices would wait for the select out signal. When they saw it, if they didn't recognize the address on the bus, they would pass the select signal. The interface was designed to work in two modes. Um, it could interleave transfers from different devices, different slow devices, or the interface could be dedicated to a single device in the case of high-speed devices like uh, tapes and therapy. 31 coaxial cables, so it was quite a, quite a big physical uh, interface. And, of course, one of the consequences of having a standard interface is that it rather opened the door to other people who wanted to make people that had put devices to attach to IBM systems. So uh, that was one of the uh, consequences, which I don't, I don't know if that was ever discussed in the Sprint Committee, Jim. Uh, no one. You didn't make it very easy. <laughs> <laughs> I believe we did have to publish the specification. But, um, yeah, but all of that, all of that developed over the subsequent years where, where we had to provide interface data not only for I.O. but for memory and, and other, other yeah. technology components of the system. Uh, 
Channels were capable of executing a rudimentary program, channel program, and the channel program consisted of a string, a chain of, of channel control words. So the start IO instruction has <coughs> specified the, the address of the device that was to be the subject of the IO operation. The address of the first channel control word channel command word, was placed in location 72 in storage. This was a fixed assignment in storage decided by the architects. That was the pointer for the channel program, which was the string of control words in some block of control words at some point in memory. When an I.O. operation terminated, the, the status of that I.O. operation was dumped by the channel into location 64, eight bytes into location 64, which gave the address of the last command word that executed, uh, any residual count if all the data hadn't been transferred in that CCW, and various flags which define the status of that operation. So those two locations were quite hard work because they served for all the channels in the system, and I think uh, it subsequently they turned out to be something of a bottleneck uh, in the architecture, fixing those locations. Two broad classes of IO devices, as I think I've said, the, the slow byte by byte devices, printers, um, communications, and the high speed ones. And that really dictated two types of channels. The selector channel, which on the large machines was an independent standalone box, um, and that would talk to one, one disk or one tape at a time. And the other type of channel was the multiplex channel, which would multiplex data transfer between many. The information that the channel stored about the I.O. activity that was going on on its interface, um, it was held in, in sub, it was called sub-channel information, and it consisted of the channel control word address of the control word currently being executed, or maybe the next one to be executed, the address in memory where data was being moved to or from, uh, what type of operation was it in, input or output, uh, and the count of the number of bytes that had been transferred on that operation. So the channel during that operation was continually updating the, uh, this information. The selector channel, of course, would only need one sub-channel because it only executed one I operation at a time. But on the multiplex channel, you had up to 256 of these. And that was where we found on 140, and the most economical way of storing those was in the bump on there where the other other channel could get to.
um, actually worked quite nicely. We, we kept hardware registered, we kept address, uh, hardware address, and we had a five byte shift register on the interface. And the microcode used to load two bytes at a time into that five byte shift register while the device was taking bytes out of the end of the shift register. And when the count went to zero, we had a flag on that buffer which traveled down the buffer with the last byte of data so that we knew whether we'd given exactly the right number of bytes or not. That, that was very manageable. Um, on the multiplexer channel, uh, again, the large systems used a single standalone, uh, used the CPU data flow as their channel. And um, the This all happened a long time ago, so... Um, yes, the multiplex channel actually had no data flow at all of its own. It used the whole of the CPU data flow on more than 40. There were about 50 gates, 50 logic gates, over and above what was needed pace. That triggered a branch in the microcode, a hardware branch, and forced the branch in the microcode. Um, at the end of the current memory cycle, we were never allowed to interrupt during the memory cycle. Address in then forced the branch in the microcode to a routine which dumped, took seven cycles to store away in local store all the CPU registers. Then there was about 26 cycles of uh, microcode where we fetched the CCW information out of the bump for the uh, device that was requesting service, updating it, put a byte on the interface, and then at the end of that sequence, another seven cycles where we restored the, uh, the data flow back to its. Uh, previous state and the CPU instruction that had been interrupted then carried on working. So the, uh, the CPU in the Model 40 was continually changing hands and I think we, we could have up to 128 sub-channels there so you could theoretically have 128 IR operations and the CPU instruction stream share in the same data flow. The timing of the um, on the multiplex channel, it was something like four microseconds, four and a half microseconds to dump the data flow, four and a half to restore it, and about 16 microseconds to process a byte. So we, we, on the multiplex channel, we tended to think in terms of the interference of I/O activities with the CPU operation. But, uh, if you had 10, 10 kilobytes per second worth of I/O activity on the multiplex channel, that equated to about a 50%, uh, 25% interference with the CPU. CPU was effectively running at only 75% of its speed. So that's, um, that's an overview of the architecture and the way we implemented the channels on the, uh, on the 360 model 40. <coughs> Technology has moved faster than anything else. So 
but it's not only an enabling technology, it's perhaps the most, well, I think it's the most key and, uh, and fast changing. And as we all know, what was uh, uh, researched yesterday is uh, state of the art today. What's state of the art of today you can throw away in uh, five years' time and buy something uh, new at a uh, fraction of the cost. So, because of the breadth of technology in System 360, uh, I've been forced to sort of limit it to those sort of topics on the board there. Uh, but before doing that, I, I, I think from my personal perspective, there are sort of five key technologies, uh, not that I'm going to talk about, but most of which we talked about today. But let me just say what I think they are the key ones. First of all, I think programming technology is fundamentally very important. And because that's the technology that enables the end user to get his job done. Uh, the next one is the architecture, which uh, I was talking about. And I liken that to the, the skeleton, if you like, of all of us. It's the skeleton of, uh, of, of system design. Um, although we may all have uh, different, when, when we see each of us in an audience, we may all look different. Uh, underneath, we've all got basically the same skeleton. That's why I think architecture is so key. Uh, because it's the thing that provides the basis upon which the, the system designer and to a degree the programmer hangs his, his product on. Thirdly, there's the sort of technology I'm going to talk to you today, which ranges from everything from, from silicon chips uh, up to magnetic uh, disk storage or what have you. Uh, and today, of course, display technology. Uh, fourthly, and uh, perhaps uh, somewhat underestimated, is manufacturing technology. Without a good manufacturing base, believe me, System 360 would never have happened. And again, as Peter said earlier on, it was because IBM had this very well-founded, well-structured, well-disciplined, and well-automated uh, manufacturing technology in place was the cornerstone on which these high production volumes hinge. And lastly, by no means least, uh, perhaps calling it a technology may be stretching it a little, but I think uh, the, the techniques and the features built in in order to service uh, our products in the field after shipment uh, were also very fundamental. And a good deal of the design, perhaps unspoken to today, a good deal of that thinking went into that, the way these products were going to be serviced and upgraded and maintained. <coughs> So there we have uh, the agenda of things we're going to talk to uh, fairly briefly. Uh, but, um, uh, and I thought it's probably best to start at the bottom with the key, <laughs> key chips, if you like, and, feed, and build upwards. Now, let me try this uh, high technology device here. Uh, first of all, where did this all happen? Uh, this is the center of the IBM universe, uh, the system 360, which is. Uh, Hursley House in Hursley Park. Uh, Bill Quinn, tell me. You sure it wasn't 16? <laughs> <laughs> Building 1720 and it's still there. Uh, superb building. Has all the key functions for getting 360 going, like personnel, the canteen, the library, uh, the lab manager. Uh, all the real work was done, in fact, in some prefabricated buildings or upgraded hangars, which were uh, hidden away somewhat in the house in which we all worked. And in fact, where John Fenton had his office and uh, did all these things. And this, this picture you can see was actually taken this year uh, during the drought. And, uh, the reason I like it is that it shows that everywhere is very really parched. Uh, as were all the engineers at that stage in Perth. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, John upheld the uh, no drinking on site uh, uh, culture, I guess it might be. Um, so, in fact, we annexed another building called the King's Head, which was a pub down in the village. In fact, uh, that perhaps most of the key design decisions and uh, some of the fundamental principles of that evolved in the King's Head along the laboratory. Here's a picture of it today. 
um, laboratory with uh, some roughly 2,000 people, uh, uh, developers of one sort or another, uh, some international developers, some uh, belonging to the IBM UK company. It's quite an extensive establishment. Unfortunately, all of those super old uh, hang those temporary hangers eventually did go after some 20 years. Not all of them. That was the export to see what Well, export. Right. Export? Oh, right, right. So, uh, yeah. right there. Yeah, it's been taken away since. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, was the biggest, that was the biggest drawing office built in the, during the war after they were bombed out of Southampton. They developed all the later models Spitfires. And that was their drawing in on the Hursley Park, and that was their drawing office. Anyway, so here we go, starting up from the bottom, right, the main bottom here. Th this, in fact, was the, the, the system uh, technology that was used for the precursors of 360, all the 1400 series and the 7000 series. Uh, and you can see it was uh, a series of uh, discrete devices, uh, discrete transistors with heat sinks on them. And typically on here, we might get one or possibly two Gates of uh, logic. And clearly, this technology was running out of speed. As uh, David Reed said, we were trying to get a range of uh, system performance, uh, ranging from six or seven nanoseconds up in that, uh, you know, up to two, 200 nanoseconds uh, switching times. Uh, and clearly, this thing was absolutely no good. Uh, it, first of all, it was expensive. Secondly, it was relatively unreliable. In fact, in System 360, we were looking for something like two orders of magnitude improvement in reliability over this level of technology. Um, uh, thirdly, it was uh, it was in a completely undefined in electrical environment. There were no no semblance of transmission line techniques in this at all. It was just sort of uh, printed wiring on one side, you poke the component through, uh, and uh, the switching speeds and uh, edges on the uh, the transitions uh, weren't sufficiently fast and really worried about it, so you weren't concerned too much about reflections down the line or that sort of thing. So that had to change. We had to go to a transmission line type of environment uh, for all our signal propagation. Uh, thirdly, of course, it was quite expensive. Uh, these um, individual components were quite expensive, not because of these. The, the silicon chip inside it was expensive, but the actual encapsulation, putting a matic uh, environment, if you like, around the chip, uh, was costing a lot of money. Yeah. And it also cost a lot of money in order to connect the chip to the means <coughs> which came out of the bottom. Uh, and in fact, the, the packaging of the chip in these things, in fact, was costing a lot more than the chip itself. So this thing had to go. So where should we go? Um, as I said, technology is changing very rapidly. Uh, Noise at uh, Fairchild and TDI and the IBM research labs were working on um, fully integrated circuits. And clearly, that was you know, not, not just around the corner, not very far away, you know, perhaps four or five years ago. You know, should we wait and go for that and take a risk? Remember, we're talking here uh, orders of magnitude more in terms of volume. Uh, the problem with integrated circuits at that stage was that um, it was very much a, a sort of laboratory, almost a laboratory toy, but certainly uh, at the laboratory stage, there was no manufacturing capability for, them, for putting these things into production in high volumes and at the right sort of quality levels. So, from the, just a technical point of view, fully integrated circuits didn't look attractive. Secondly, at that stage, integrated circuits were very slow, where we were looking for switching speeds, typically the logic, logic speeds of about 30 nanoseconds. Uh, the integrated circuits at that stage were in more than 100 nanoseconds, so we were 10, 10 times perhaps almost uh, out in terms of speed. So what we decided to do was to go for a hybrid technology that could subsequently evolve very easily to take the benefit of uh, integrated circuits when it came along. Which 
push in the wrong direction. Um, so that was what we did, and uh, John alluded to that, and John Peckoff alluded to that in his um, report on the Spanish Committee. So the key element here was to make it a continuous flow thing, fully automated, to take uh, advantage of the uh, manufacturing automation that was coming in place, and also to provide the volumes at high quality and high reliability. And so we evolved this thing called the uh, SLT uh, hybrid IC module, which I'll be describing uh, in, uh, in a few minutes. So first of all, at the chip level, uh, there was nothing unique to IBM in the basic sort of uh, diffusion processes for making ICs. Except that we tended to use NBN transistors and the rest of the uh, industry used PMP, but uh, that's by the by. But the thing that was unique was this um, connection technology on the outside of it, where we made the connections to. And what I'm showing here is, in fact, the two fundamental chips. This is a, a dual diode chip, uh, and this is a, a, a simple PMP transistor. You'll see that the, the uh, in, in corners here, there are the three sort of uh, balls of metal which in fact are uh, solder. And the technique uh, which IBM developed, and which was unique to the industry, was in fact to connect the chip directly to the substrate via a solder reflow process. So uh, you'll see that perhaps on the Slide. Here we have a, a cross section of the chip, the silicon. Um, as I said, there's nothing unique too much about the PMP diffusions here or the aluminium uh, conductors to the uh, ion connections. The key thing that was key was this thing here called a protective glass layer. Uh, the way that worked was that the whole surface of the, of the, of the wafer, the chip in particular, was covered in a fascinating layer of glass. Uh, and the development of that glass was non trivial because what it had to be was very thin. It had to be uh, reasonably easily etchable if you wanted to make these contacts. But it had to be pinhole free because the whole essence of that uh, glass layer was to avoid uh, the need to put this thing in a hematic seal, which was costing an arm and a limb to the rest of the industry. So by having that glass there, the, 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 the chip itself was completely inert to what was going on the inside. Um, the uh, solar balls were put on, in fact, uh, in, a, in a furnace. Uh, the while, while it was in the uh, a sputtering machine, the um, holes were made through the glass uh, down to the uh, the, the epitaxial layers. Uh, chrome copper gold was deposited onto the aluminium lands underneath, and then this um, uh, solar ball was put on the top. I don't think I need to say too much else about that one. So here's the next level of package, which is the uh, so called SLT module, solid logic technology. It's uh, a hot, in round numbers, a half inch square when it's got it projected camera at the top. And you can see the, uh, the uh, chips here, two diode chips and a transistor chip um, for a typical and or invert module. Uh, also included on this substrate were uh, resistors, which in fact uh, are deposited, and I'll show you a little bit more about that in a moment, and then etched to the right uh, value of resistors. The, the chips here, you can now see are upside down, sort of flip chips, if you like. <coughs> so the, the connections underneath uh, are auto automatically made to the land patterns on the model, again by putting them into a furnace. So again, a fully automated process for assembling these things. No uh, army of girls sitting looking through magnifying glasses with uh, spotlights, uh, stitching pieces of gold wire between the, between the chip and the, uh, and the next level. This uh, slide shows the, the various steps in making this uh, same model. 
We start off with this 95% alumina substrate. And another good thing about this alumina substrate is that it has, because it's 95% alumina, it's got pretty good uh, thermal properties. And because we flip the chip upside down, and the, those solder balls are in close proximity to the actual um, uh, device junctions, then we get a very good heat transfer between the device itself and the aluminium. And from the aluminium uh, alumina substrate, uh, by these connecting pins, we get a very good heat transfer. So if you like, it's uh, got a thermal sink built into the design, uh, which allows us to keep the temperatures low and consequently, of course, reliability high. The first step after the basic alumina is to print on this man pattern which is a, sort of like a double link in a, in a binder, which is then fired off at 800 degrees centigrade. Uh, we then print on the uh, resistors. Uh, the resistors are, um, again, um, uh, basically sort of uh, cadmium and silver uh, metal in the binder, uh, put on and again fire. Uh, we then swage in the interconnecting pins around the corner, 12 pins. Those are then, the whole thing is then dipped into a solder bath to solder the pins onto the lamp pattern. The resistors are then trimmed from a nominal of about 15% uh, low resistor value when we print it on to within 1% when after the etching process. And last but not least, of course, the uh, transistors and the diodes are, uh, are automatically soldered in place. Now, the, the thing which uh, turned out to be quite attractive and quite unique about this is that because before the transistors are put in place, there is solder on these lamps, when you put the uh, chip on, you don't have to accurately align it. As long as you put it approximately in the right position, which is a very easy automation job, uh, you then just put this thing into a reflow service, turn on the uh, furnace, the solder melts, and the surface tension of the solder just sucks the uh, chip into the right alignment uh, and you get a perfect positioning of the chip in place. Um, this is the uh, circuit diagram of that particular module. I won't take you through it, but you can see it's a, a three input um, and or invert module. It's got a dot or connection there and it just inverts to the so it's quite a simple circuit. Uh, but this thing, it says 20 nanoseconds, that's unloading. Ty typically in a, uh, in a, with a fan out of about five, probably about uh, 30 nanoseconds or something like that. Uh, the next level of package is the car, and I'm afraid that's a particularly good photograph. I've plenty of good examples here. Um, th this is a, a, a sort of original design of the car. And with six of the modules, the position for six of these modules on the car. Um, the uh, card itself, instead of being uh, an epoxy paper card like the previous uh, SMS one, is now uh, a multi layer epoxy glass card with printed circuit holes uh, from the top layer through to the bottom one. But uh, sandwiched in between is a, a power and a ground plane distribution system. So the center of this sort of sandwich provides not only the, the power supplies, but it also provides, uh, if you like, a ground plane on which the surface wiring, with which the surface wiring forms a transmission line. So we've now got a, a if you like, a control impedance um, transmission system, which allows us to connect in between the various uh, active circuits on the car. Now, the original intent of this six-pack car was that uh, it would have, shall we say, you know, six of these uh, AOI modules on it, or, or some such number, or whatever other modules. And there'd be a limited number of those cars, which would then be available as a pickup item to all the uh, logic designers uh, in the IBM system universe. So that ideally, the intention was that 
nobody would personalize this car. And all of personalization, the logic design, if you like, the system design, would be done at the next level of package. Now, it wasn't very long before we got into doing the Model 40 and the other system designers uh, got the same experience. Well, so if you tied the logic designer's hands in that manner, first of all, you weren't going to get the performance required. Secondly, you were going to get a lot of redundancy. Uh, and thirdly, it was going to be virtually impossible to personalize it at the so-called level, level uh, at the next level. So unfortunately, to some degree, that concept went out of the window. Um, and the natural development of that was, in fact, initially to double the size of this car. And instead of making it a, a six-module car, to make it a 12-module car, but allow the logic designer to make his own car. And that was great from a cost performance point of view. It was great for optimizing the design to a specific design. Point. The bad news was, of course, that the number of part numbers exploded dramatically. So that when you came to manufacture this thing, the manufacturing logistics became more complex. And perhaps more importantly, the problem of putting spares of all these uh, now hundreds of designs of uh, these sort of first level packages became quite expensive. And of course, any subsequent change to that design just rippled through that uh, logistic system, creating in its way its own sort of nightmares. But anyway, that was the, uh, uh, the, 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 the cost pros and cons were carefully traded off uh, by the uh, product managers, because they were responsible not only for the system design, not only for the manufacturing costs, but also for the total cost of that system to add its life in the field. So they weren't just development managers, they were really product managers in the true sense of the word. Um, I think I've talked about most of uh, these things, or somebody has. Um, I should have just said this one here, that the, the module itself was protected by an aluminium can, which not only gave mechanical protection, but gave additional thermal uh, protection as well. some examples out here on the on the desk at the front here. This is the uh, motherboard in size about, um, I remember right, about 9 inches by 13 inches or thereabouts. And uh, contains some, uh, I don't remember, 60 of them? Anybody remember? I can't remember. Uh, and on the cards. The, the interesting thing about this is, I'm sorry, this, this is in fact a gate with a number of these uh, 9 by 13 panels in it. I think about 64 or so cards in the, on, uh, on the board. Uh, the gate itself was interconnected by ribbon cables. Uh, it was plugged in down the side of the board. Um, again, these ribbon cables had two advantages. One was, of course, that they were uh, not particularly bulky, so you could lay them flat one upon the other. But more importantly, of course, again, we could maintain the, tri the transmission line characteristics of the, uh, of the signal parts. Uh, this is the back side of the board. Um, this is a, a, a development uh, board, in fact. Uh, ideally, the wiring programs, the automated wiring programs, should have uh, obviated the necessity for these overflow wires. Uh, in the early days, certainly, the The only difference, um, as you mentioned here, is that the, um, 
And these little black connectors here in fact the way we got the power supplies onto the from the from the man of the bus which ran up the back here uh, onto the bus um, themselves. In fact uh, this as far to my knowledge was the first time that the switch mode power supplies had suddenly been used by IBM as a as a power source and I suspect to uh, probably in the industry as well. These are just photograph of the ribbon cables. Um, so here's the uh, electronic packaging summary. Uh, no personalization at the chip or the module level by the um, logic designer or the system designer. Uh, personalization at the card level as it turned out, and certainly at the board level. Uh, but again, the key thing was that all these uh, steps in the technology, steps in the package uh, were all focused on high degrees of automation, which was absolutely key for the sort of high volumes. In fact, just to give some feel, uh, in the first um, four years of manufacture of uh, these SLT modules, uh, there were some three quarters of a billion modules produced in two plants uh, in, in the world. So the volumes were very high and the risk of failure was enormous. Uh, just very briefly on, uh, on the main memory, the importance of which has been emphasized, uh, I think, three times already, so I won't say a lot more about it, except to say that, of course, that um, core storage already existed prior to 360. What, what hadn't existed, in fact, was the reduction in the, in the size of the cores, and also the degree, once more, of the automation in the, uh, in the manufacturing process. Uh, and you can see that, in fact, we got down from, uh, well, typically sort of two microseconds sort of cycle time of the capability uh, of the memory of the uh, model 40 and model 50, but uh, three quarters of a microsecond. But that what a, a cost penalty in terms of power, <laughs> 48 kilowatts per megabyte, which uh, if you translate that into your laptop computer, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you're a rechargeable battery. <laughs> but uh, uh, just an observation here uh, because of this availability of core storage, at what was at that time uh, comparatively low cost and price, not only made it uh, a very profitable commodity as far as I've been able to say, but also it was really the way that got us into OS 360. We would never have got into these more sophisticated operating systems, either DOS or OS 360, if it hadn't been for the availability of these, uh, of these courts. So here they are. Uh, you've all seen um, some examples on the uh, desk here. Uh, just mention a couple of the key attributes. First of all, the whole of these uh, planes, uh, typically there are uh, four segments like this in each plane typically 64 by 64, with 64 X wires and 64 Y wires down the side. Um, the cores were put in place on a metal plate initially with little slots, diagonal slots in it. The cores were sort of vibrated and uh, would you believe they fell into the slots. Because they were in the slots, uh, we have an automated uh, wiring system, uh, far be it from little girls pushing wires through these cores. All these wires, the X wires and the Y wires and the sense wire, which is this funny thing with the loop, they're all done by machine. Uh, and it tries to think about getting those through a 13,000 uh, inch hole with three, uh, three wires. It was, it was non trivial there, but uh, the machine was there to do it. And again, contributed vastly to the uh, relatively low cost and the high reliability. Of course, all the uh, connections to these tabs in the plane. Made by spot welding. Uh, these frames were then stacked up one on top of the other, and the uh, I/O connections at the end here uh, again were zapped uh, auto automatically as a stack, uh, one stack at a time. Uh, I hope this doesn't complete with those numbers. <laughs> it's roughly right, I think, but you can see uh, they ranging from uh, one and a half to. The bottom one is 256. 
two five six. Oh, that was the engine. <laughs> right, two five six. Here's the um, model fourteen mainframe. I won't talk too much about this because Tony's going to talk to it. So, um, uh, this will be uh, we got just when we're going to store things. The uh, core store is here, uh, and you can see all the uh, logic gates down the side. <coughs> okay. Um, this is probably about as near as I get to talking about manufacturing technology, uh, a thing called design automation, which caused a lot of pain and anguish to the core designer. Uh, there was a front end of this uh, new tool, uh, but it was obviously critical for uh, this advanced level of hardware design. design. And what? Well, we designed a lot. And we designed a lot of it, yes. Um, but the key elements to it were not only did it, was it a tool for designing logic and verifying it, but it was a tool for physical placement of the, uh, of the modules. Nobody really had to worry too much about where on the car and the wind. Uh, it placed them in the right place. Uh, we were able to do fault simulation. You know, what happens if this chip fails? What does it do for the system? And of course, it also having done the fault simulation, um, we then need something to give to the full customer engineer at the end of the day that says, "Geez, if you get this sort of symptom, fellow, uh, this is uh, this is the car in the face." Uh, and last but not least in these um, attributes was this manufacturing interface. And nobody should go away thinking that that wasn't one of the key things that they. System 360 a success. The ability to release pretty much at the same time this range of systems, this range of IO devices into manufacturing plants anywhere in the world via a discipline uh, digital data interface. Uh, no pieces of paper flying around, everything done by, uh, uh, by data processing and uh, release tapes into the manufacturing locations. And remember that one of the key philosophies of IBM was this sort of concept that we had a worldwide design center for a specific design, like the Model 40 was designed in Persia for use throughout the world. But the Model 40 was manufactured on a continental basis, so there would be a plant of manufacture for the Model 40, like uh, uh, one in Europe, one in the USA, and probably one and one in South America. So this design had to go from this manufacturer and this interface table on the design had to be released then to each of these manufacturing uh, locations. And last but not least, the, the sales and the servicing would be done on the, on the country basis. So it's that sort of tripod of, uh, of responsibilities, if you like, that were also rather fundamental. But overriding all these things was the product manager's responsibility all of those sort of three aspects. If any one of the manufacturing screwed up, if customer engineering screwed up, if the salespeople didn't make their quota, then it was you know the John Fair clubs of the world who had to carry the cat. So I have my due time. Um, well, we're catching up very well. <laughs> How long are you going? We, 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 no, no, I think you're another ready. five to ten minutes is fine. So another five to ten minutes. Uh, this is uh, just uh, an example of a logic design sheet, which, if you like, was the uh, logic designer's uh, input to the system. Uh, he drew it out, in fact, probably defined it first on a, on a sort of master sheet, uh, put it into the system, the wiring, the wiring placement programs do their thing, and it came out with these logic blocks, uh, pin numbers on the module or on the car. All the physical design was all made. Right, just, just to bring up now magnetic disk storage. Now, magnetic disk storage existed on IBM system prior to, to 360. Uh, so it was well established uh, know how and manufacturing the base. Um, in fact, the, uh, uh, again, as Peter Tipman said earlier, I, IBM had a, a well established leadership in. In magnetic disk storage technology or in drone technology. And that was brought about, in fact, through uh, three key things. And again, very much manufacturing related. Uh, 
the rest of all batch fabricated here is to make to make new thin film technology for making uh, very low weight, low mass, uh, leaf like things. Uh, secondly, a disc technology, uh, which in those days was um, in fact particular discs. But uh, again, the ability to make uh, high coercivity but low uh, aspersion, that means very smooth discs, so you could in fact fly this batch fabricated head very close to the, uh, to the disc surface. And as I said, because of those two things, the ability to fly the head very low. And when you fly the head low, you've got uh, very narrow gap heads, then clearly the aerial density goes up, so you get more data for your buck, uh, more data for disc, and more data for track. The uh, second advantage we had, of course, was that at the start of 360, we were able to offer our customers and the uh, programmers of the world a, a wide range of products. Now, I don't think this is a complete list, and I won't go through it, but you can see it, it spanned everything from um, drums to, uh, uh, I thought I got it, uh, I haven't got the data store on hand, there's a data store somewhere. But anyway, you can see, in fact, that the range of cost, the range of performance, the range of seat times. For all of these things, particularly the uh, seat time, the, the discs in the price performance bracket, was very important for things like uh, OS 60 and OS 360 and plus, in order to get the performance out. Uh, lastly, uh, this is my only sort of projection into today, if you like, from 360 was this fabulous curve, which shows this straight line characteristic that started uh, uh, perhaps prior to the 360 and has gone on through today, uh, where we're now, I guess probably even lower than this now.
now like to carry on and uh, have our final uh, presentation before we have the summary at the end. Uh, Tony Proudman, um, Red Physics uh, at Cambridge, he joined the uh, Herzog Laboratories in June '59 and worked on Redel Only Memories. Uh, he <coughs> signed corporate responsibility.